Good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome everybody uh, to our um, first Wednesday session of our 13th annual Adam Smith Week, sponsored by the Center for Public Choice and Market Process. The mission of the Center for Public Choice and Market Process is to advance the understanding of the economic, political, and moral foundations of a free society. Uh, we've had a very exciting week of programming so far, but it's far from over, so I hope that you'll uh, not only um, join us this afternoon, but this evening, we have Virginia Postrel coming up and uh, still four more events before the week is over. So um, Brian is going to put in the uh, chat for everybody to see the URL to be able to find the schedule to register for further events for Adam Smith Week. Uh, but that URL is go.cfc.edu slash ASW. I encourage you all to look at our website, our Facebook page, or follow us on Twitter or Instagram to learn more about our program and to learn more about our activities. Um, we're not alone in celebrating Adam Smith Week this year. We've got nine other centers and organizations that have uh, been joining us and offering um, events and sponsorship. Uh, specifically, I wanna welcome all the members of the Bostiat Society chapters from across the country today to this event. Uh, I have long been involved with the Bostjat Society and it's something that's near and dear to my heart. So I was thrilled that we could partner with them and AIER for this event. Um, at this um, time, I'd like to um, uh, turn it over to and introduce you to one of our market process scholars, uh, Lucas Moyen, to actually introduce our panelists for today uh, before we get started. So Lucas. Dr. C, and thank you to the speakers for being here. So I'll get started on the introductions. We'll start with Corey DeAngelis. Um, he is one of the nation's leading authorities on school choice and homeschooling. Corey holds a Bachelor of Business Administration and a Master of Arts in Economics from the University of Texas at San Antonio, and he got his PhD in Education Policy from the University of Arkansas. He was named to the Forbes 30 Under 30 list for his work on education policy. DeAngelis is the Director of School Choice at the Reason Foundation and an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute. His research primarily focuses on the effects of school choice programs on non-academic outcomes, such as criminal activity, character skills, mental health, political participation, and schooling supply. He has authored or co-authored over 40 journal articles, book chapters, and reports on education policy. He's been published in outlets like the Wall Street Journal and USA Today. And in his spare time, he volunteers helping economically challenge middle school students at a San Antonio food bank. And then there's Phil Magnus. So Phil Magnus is an economic historian whose work focuses on the United States and the broader Atlantic world. His research explores the intersection of history and political economy, especially long ter longer term trends in the macro economy, focusing on taxation, trade, and economic inequality. He also works on the political economy and business ethics of higher education and is the co-author of Cracks in the Ivory Tower. He also wrote books called Colonization After Emancipation, Lincoln and the Movement for Black Resettlement, and What is Classical Liberal History. He got his PhD in public policy and a master's in public policy from George Mason University and a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science at the University of St. Thomas. He's currently a senior research fellow at the American Institute for Economic Research. And before that, he taught at American University, George Mason University, and Barry College. We're really excited to have both of these speakers with us today. So on behalf of the Center for Public Choice and Market Process and everyone on this call, thank you for being with us. Thank you, Lucas. And thank you, Phil and Corey, for joining us today uh, for what I hope will be a really um, exciting discussion about sort of where we are with regards to COVID-19 and school policy. Um, so let me just start off by saying for everybody in the audience that, you know, Corey's primary area is, is mostly through K through 12 and primary education, where Phil has tend to focus more on higher ed. And so as we sort of throw the questions out and, and proceed in this thing, we'll sort of proceed that way where each can sort of talk about uh, their areas of expertise. But let's start with the obvious. Um, the title of your talk suggests that there were many problems with um, the education system long before uh, the pandemic and COVID um, started. So let's talk to those issues uh, that were really problematic. 
um, both in K through 12 and in higher ed. So Corey, maybe you want to get us started on that? Yeah, uh, look, COVID didn't break the public school system. It was already broken. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic simply put a spotlight on the main problem with K-12 public education in the United States, which is a massive, long-existing power imbalance between the producers of the service, the K-12 public school monopoly, and individual families. It's one thing for a school to fail to educate your children year after year, yet still get their, your children's education dollars, but it's another conversation altogether for that same institution to continue to get your children's education dollars, regardless of whether they even open their doors for business. And what's really interesting that a lot of people have pointed out in the past year is that over the, 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 the whole time period over the past year, private schools have either been open or they've been fighting really hard to reopen their doors. For example, in Kentucky, you had private schools take the fight all the way up to the Supreme Court to fight against their governor for closing their doors for in-person instruction, where you had, in the same state, you had the Kentucky Education Association cheering the decision to keep the schools closed. You had a Catholic school, a private school in Sacramento, California, even rebranded itself to try to get around the government's arbitrary closure rules that applied to schools, but not daycare. So they retrained all their employers and said, oh, we're a daycare we need to open our doors for business for our customers. But on the other side of the things, we've seen that the public school teachers unions have been fighting for the opposite. They've been fighting to keep their doors closed. And it's not because that there's bad people in the public school system, not at all. I think the difference is one of incentives, that one of these sectors gets your money regardless of how well they do. And this year in particular, as we've all seen, regardless of whether they even open their doors for business. And the only way that we're gonna fix this messed up set of incentives when it comes to the K-12 education system is to provide bottom-up accountability by funding students directly as opposed to closed institutions with things like education savings accounts. If the money were to follow the child, we wouldn't have as many problems as we've seen over the past year because families could then take their children education dollars to a private school that's more than happy to open their doors for business and this would incentivize the public schools to change their game and, and up their game as well and in fact there's been one study on this in the past year by um, Michael Hartney and Leslie Finger published at Brown University working paper series finding that places with more low-cost private schools in the area the public schools were more likely to reopen their doors for business, which gives credence to the argument that competition has something to do with it. And before I kick it over to Phil, there have also been four studies that have looked at the relationship between the strength of the teachers unions in the area and the likelihood of the public school reopening for in-person instruction. And no matter how you slice the data, no matter what proxy you use for teachers union strength, no matter how many controls you add into the different specifications, Places with stronger teachers unions were statistically a lot less likely to reopen their doors for in-person instruction. And meanwhile, my latest study with MIT's Christos McCready's found that no matter how you slice the data for over 12,000 public school districts in the United States, funding was not related to the reopening status of traditional public schools. If anything, some of our models found that the remote districts that kept their doors closed for in-person instruction actually might have been a little bit more well-funded than their in-person uh, counterparts. So it doesn't seem like it's about money. It doesn't seem like it's about safety. Most of these studies also found that COVID risk as measured by cases per capita and deaths per capita were not statistically related to the reopening decision of the school district, but that political partisanship and teachers union influence were the main predictors of whether a school opened its doors for business. And so the main takeaway here is look, this last year has been more about politics and power dynamics than about safety and the needs of millions of families across the country. Phil, what are your thoughts on the higher ed circles? Well, higher ed was a lot like uh, lower ed, as we could call it, uh, during um, the years leading up into COVID, and that there were many problems that were uh, already emergent. And you can see this just talking to students around the country. Uh, one of the main things that is on everyone's mind is tuition is going up, and people are taking on a lot of debt uh, to just get a college degree. And this has been a, a, a major concern of the policy discussions around higher ed. Yet at the same time, if we look to the higher ed system, uh, it's flush with cost overruns, with administrative bloat, 
with uh, expensive building projects that have been taken on at uh, campuses around the country. So it seems that uh, not only are our students uh, very concerned about getting uh, uh, bang for the buck on what they uh, are, are putting into the higher ed system in terms of their payments, but uh, a lot of that money seems to be going to uh, what I would call superfluous or peripheral functions that are not directly related to uh, the provision of a, a college degree. And this gets back to, uh, I guess, a theme we should bring up Adam Smith since this is Adam Smith week, something that uh, Smith observed back in the Wealth of Nations, uh, a problem when he looked at the higher ed system of his own day. Uh, he actually taught at several different universities, uh, most notably uh, U University of Edinburgh in Scotland, but he was also down at Oxford in, in England for a while. And he had a, a, a passage in there where he, he compared the two institutions and he noticed something really striking that in England at Oxford, the faculty were often very lazy. They didn't show up for class. Uh, the quality that was provided in the classroom wasn't all that great. And the students really didn't care about attending. So there was a, a, a real disconnect and kind of a breakdown in the system, even though they're paying in a whole bunch of money to go to Oxford to, uh, to get a degree. Yet if you went up to Edinburgh, uh, the students were more engaged, uh, the better faculty were rising through the ranks and getting promoted and bad faculty, those that neglected their classes, uh, tended to fall by the wayside or um, even get fired or leave the university system. And he asked the question, well, what's the difference here? And the difference happened to be the way that it was paid for. Uh, up in Scotland, there was a direct connection between the quality of what was delivered in the classroom and kind of a tipping system that students paid in terms of fees to uh, uh, professors as kind of a reward for what they had delivered in the classroom. So there was a direct connection between the payer and the payee uh, and the delivery of college content. And what I've argued is that in higher ed today, that's largely been severed. We have third party payers. Uh, we have government agencies that issue grants. We have subsidized loans that come through uh, mostly a government framework. Uh, we may have uh, private loans that are going through again, a third party payer uh, for students when they're trying to get a college degree. And the recipient of that money is not the uh, professor, him or herself, it actually goes into a, a complex university bureaucracy where it's dispersed and uh, portions of that are captured in, uh, in rents for political projects and other things that are not connected to the provision of education. And that's spread around the university system. And it turns out that quite a few people that work in the university system, separate and apart from the faculty, separate and apart from the, uh, the professors that are teaching in the classroom, are actually just careerists working in, in uh, secondary and tertiary functions, not really related to the uh, provision of education. If you look over time between uh, about 1970 and just last year, the largest area of growth in higher ed has been in mid-tier administrators, people who work in student services or finance or the admissions office, the environmental sustainability office, the diversity office, you name it. Uh, they have basically quadrupled in that period since uh, the early 1970s to the present day, uh, even to the point that they outpace the growth in the number of faculty, they outpace the growth in the number of students that are attending higher ed. So that's what's really driving the costs up and absorbing all this tuition payment. So all that existed prior to COVID. Uh, we entered into uh, a very strange situation where higher ed rapidly locked down, uh, even a week or two before the rest of the country officially locked down. What did colleges do? They dispersed their students and told them to go home for the semester. They converted to online. And they did this very rapidly and without much thought uh, put behind it. We can talk a little bit about some of the implications of that, but the long-term trend has been, higher ed has been very reluctant to resume normalcy. It's lagged behind the rest of the country, except for the lower ed system, which also has stayed closed in, uh, in getting back to uh, normal operations. And that raises the question of people that are still paying full tuition for uh, very reduced and limited services in many, in many cases um, are now seeing a, uh, an even greater disconnect that existed previously between the dollars they are paying in and the quality of the uh, education that's being received. And yet higher ed thus far has not been very responsive to uh, uh, accommodating some of the issues of reducing its services. In other words, higher ed is not cutting budgets of superfluous activities on campus that have nonetheless been canceled uh, insofar as it can get away with that. So uh, we have costs are continuing to rise, continuing to go up, and yet the quality is diminishing even further uh, during the wake of the pandemic. So 
Uh, yesterday, um, Brian Hooks talked about recognizing the need for bottom-up solutions. You know, to, to your comment, Bill, about Adam Smith, he pointed out that, you know, the university system for all this time really hasn't changed all that much, right? We've not become that innovative. Um, but, uh, you know, um, but nonetheless, right, there is a need for bottom-up solutions. So what do you think the best way, given the current environment of the pandemic, and as Corey said, we've sort of put a spotlight on some of these things, right? People are recognizing just exactly what some of these problems are more so than usual, right? So how do you think this is going to allow us to maybe get some bottom-up reform that might be necessary to generate some innovation and some, some good outcomes uh, for both education systems? Yeah. I can speak to that for, for higher ed. We're already seeing a bit of this taking place because there are clear regional differences in the rate that colleges are reopening or allowing students to come back to campus, or even when they get back on campus, what they can do when they're there. Uh, it's the difference between, do you have to quarantine in your dorm for two weeks before you can go outside? Or are there opportunities for uh, attending in-person classes right away? And because of the regional variations, you're seeing that a lot of schools in the South, a lot of schools in some of the Western states that remained open are uh, closer to normal operations than schools in say like the Northeast or California that are still under pretty heavy lockdowns, still under restrictions. And that's been uh, manifesting in the way that uh, students are reacting to uh, the COVID crisis. They're voting with their feet and moving to universities and colleges in regions of the country that are willing to resume normal operations. Uh, over the long term, that's gonna turn into a, a, a fiscal pressure that a lot of these schools have not felt in, in many, many years, if not decades, uh, because people vote with their feet, they're taking their tuition dollars with them. Uh, the second effect that you're seeing some of the similar uh, patterns take place is some students are taking a gap year or they're deciding to maybe do some of their gen ed classes online at the local community college because uh, you know if the quality's uh, diminished uh, and you can get a, um, a gen ed credit in English 101 at your community college for a couple hundred dollars versus full tuition that comes to five or six thousand dollars for the same exact class online at your normal college or university, it makes sense to take the cheaper option and just transfer it in. So uh, you start seeing pressures coming from students making individual decisions. Um, and I'd encourage anyone that's interested in the quality of higher ed uh, to really contemplate that, whether you're a student yourself or a parent who has a, uh, a student that's about to go off to college, start asking these questions. Uh, what kind of services, what kind of return am I going to get uh, if I select this university in maybe the South or the West over another university in the Northeast that uh, historically may have been more prestigious but is now on limited operations? Yeah, I just want to point out with K-12, families are starting to smell the BS with the K-12 system. And one thing that they're seeing is that there's just a preponderance of the evidence suggests that the public schools can be open, yet they're still not open. So they're, they're not following the science. If you look at stuff like the data uh, from Brown University's Emily Oster has been tracking this for several months, finding that the positivity rates in the schools are substantially lower than the positivity rates in the overall community. And so overall suggesting that uh, school reopenings are not significant contributors of community transmission or even hospitalizations. If you look at the Brown University data, you see the lower rates in the schools. One example is uh, New York City. Their positivity rates have consistently been about 0.5% or less for case positivity rates in the schools, whereas in the overall community, it's been about 5 to 10%. Uh, so it's been about a 10th to a 20th of the rate in the overall community when we're looking at the individual schools. So schools aren't super spreaders. Uh, Dr. Oster wrote about this in the Atlantic and in the uh, Washington Post as well. Dr. Fauci himself, take it or leave it. Some people like him, some people don't. He changes his mind a lot, uh, <laughs> but he has even said, close the bars and open the schools. And he said on, on national TV that, um, the spread among children and from children is not very big at all. You have data from UNICEF of over, of, of over 190 different countries suggesting that reopening schools is not a, con, there's not a consistent link between reopening schools and the transmission of the virus in the overall community. You have CDC researchers saying in JAMA, a top medical journal, similarly that school reopenings can be done safely. 
We've seen data from Sweden for a long time now as well, suggesting that schools can safely reopen. But in addition to the scientific evidence, there have been other things over the past year that just don't add up. And this, I, these things that I'm about to talk about are convincing more families than even the peer reviewed medical articles. For example, one of the things that happened was that, well, first of all, I already talked about it. the private schools have been opening. If they were able to do it, why couldn't the public schools do it? Second is there's been a ton of hypocrisy going on in on the part of teachers union bosses. For example, you had the teachers union boss from Berkeley, California, railing against opening public schools for in-person instruction, but then sending his own kid to private schools for in-person childcare. Uh, you had in Chicago, the board member of the Chicago Teachers Union, this one really uh, blew up in her face, but she was tweeting against reopening of schools back home in Chicago, but she was doing so after traveling to Puerto Rico and vacationing in person. So people kind of scratched their head a little bit and said, well, if it's safe enough to travel in person and to vacation in person to another country, uh, then why isn't it safe enough to return to work in person? We all know why. And the reason for that is because people would rather vacation than return to work in person. That's just the reality. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. It doesn't mean that you have bad intentions. It just means that we are human beings and we react accordingly to the incentives that are put in front, in front of us. The problem is the incentives baked into the public school system. The problem isn't with these individuals that are uh, acting hypocritically. Uh, you also have... I mean, Fairfax Public Schools in, in my area, in Fairfax County, they were paying the bus drivers to drive around town, empty buses while the schools weren't even open for in-person childcare or even in-person instruction, which just didn't make any sense. It was essentially the equivalent of paying people to dig uh, holes in, uh, uh, in the ground and then filling them back up and paying them just to waste their time. It just didn't make any sense. And then also one of the weirdest things in at least 10 states that I can recall off the top of my head was that they were not reopening their schools for in-person learning because no, that was too dangerous. But then they were reopening the same public school buildings for in-person childcare services. If it's safe enough to reopen the schools for in-person childcare services, why isn't it safe enough to reopen the schools for in-person learning? What's the difference? I looked a little bit deeper into this and every single place that I saw that had this occurring was the reality of what was going on on the ground was that the public school employees were staying at home and teaching uh, virtually, whereas they were having private sector employees come in from places like the YMCA voluntarily going into those same schools and providing the in-person childcare services and while the public school employees were staying at home, which was great for the employees in both sectors, but it was horrible for the individual families because the families were having to pay up to like $300, $400 per child per week out of pocket in addition to what they were already paying through the property tax system. So again, this is another example of how the priorities are, are, are on the system in the current education setup it's not on the individual families and the families really got the short end of the stick this year. And they've looked at this situation and, and they're starting to understand that why are these closed buildings getting my children's education dollars while I'm stuck scrambling every step of the way, getting midnight emails from the superintendent saying, oh, well, you were supposed to open your school, but actually it's not happening because we had too many employee absences which is essentially a form of a strike. They call it a sick out in K-12 education, but it's actually a strike. They just call it a sick out in states where it's uh, illegal to strike, but it's essentially the same thing. And so families are starting to turn towards things like education savings accounts or what I call funding students as opposed to systems. If you look at the two latest nationwide polls on this, one from Real Clear Opinion Research, we found that nationwide and nationally representative sample Families are much more likely to support funding students directly. A 10 percentage point jump was observed between April and August of 2020 from 67% support to 77% support among families who had their kid in the public school system in a, in a demographic of families who would be uh, traditionally less likely to support school choice in other years. And uh, Morning Consult, a third party, also did a similar nationwide poll finding surges in support for all types of what people call school choice, vac voucher programs, tax credit scholarships, education savings accounts, and charter schools, every type of 
uh, school choice that they asked about surges in support from 2019 to 2020. Um, and it's probably because the teachers unions are essentially overplaying their hand by keeping schools closed for so long. And in a way, although there's been a lot of problems in the last year with, with so many things, and particularly with the K-12 public school system, is the one silver lining is that the teachers unions have inadvertently done more to advance the concept of funding students directly than anyone could have ever imagined in the past year. So, and one, one more piece of evidence, I know I talked for a long time, but I got to get it out there, is that there's this shift in the minds and hearts of individual voters of supporting school choice, but there's also a huge shift this year in actual policies getting passed at the state level, where 92% of K-12 education funding actually um, comes from. 29 states have active leg legislation this year to fund students as opposed to institution, mostly in the forms of something called education savings accounts, where um, uh, about half of the funding that would have went to your public school follows the child to an education savings account, which could be used for private school tuition and fees or home-based learning or micro schools or pandemic pods, which we could talk about later. But any government approved education expenditure, that money would follow the child to wherever they get they're getting that education. And a third of those 29 states, about 10 of the states, have already passed at least one of these bills out of at least one chamber, and about five others have passed at least one of these bills out of at least one committee. And today, right before this call, West Virginia passed out of both chambers, Senate and House, uh, that the Senate vote today was 20 to 13, an expansive program, which would be over 90% over of the school age population in West Virginia would be able to access or at least be eligible for this education savings account program. So we're actually seeing things happening on the ground um, this year. Uh, and, and I think it's because again, uh, the public school system just hasn't been there for, for millions of families this year. And families rightfully are looking towards, towards uh, seeking alternatives. So, couple things here out of that, Corey, and that is, um, one is I have a, um, I have a friend who's a headmaster of a charter school out in Colorado. And, you know, we spent time talking to him earlier this fall as they were going into the school year and all the measures that they were taking in an effort to try to be open, right? All the things that they were doing, investments they were making in cleaning crews and other devices to make sure that it was safe, but they wanted to make sure their doors were open and they kept their doors open, right? So while not a purely private school, right, it is still closer than not. And they have a, they have a lot more connection to their students and their community and their parents, right? Uh, so they've been doing that. One other thing, I think South Carolina was one of the states that attempted to uh, the governor attempted to create such a program where the financing followed the students and caught a tremendous amount of backlash uh, for it. Um, I don't know where the process ended up. I think it made it through the House, but maybe not the Senate, if I'm yeah, not that, mistaken. But yeah, just, I know I've been talking a lot, but I'll, I can give a quick update on South Carolina in particular. The, the, the governor wanted to use the relief funding uh, from the federal government to allow for families to choose private schools. And the South Carolina state Supreme Court, I want to say, nixed it as un, quote unquote unconstitutional, yet it's not, it wasn't taxpayer funding it, or state taxpayer funding. It was from the federal government. So it, it shouldn't have been an issue. And then two, South Carolina has pre-K programs and higher education programs that can both be used state taxpayer dollars at private religious or non-religious institutions. So if it wasn't a problem for those, if it's not a problem with those programs, why is it a problem for K through 12? What's interesting to me is all of these attacks only happen in the middle years for K through 12. And the only difference is one of power dynamics. Choice is the norm for the most part in relative to K through 12 for higher education and with pre-K services, but choice really threatens an entrenched special interest that profits from getting your children's education dollars mostly when it comes to the K to 12 years. So you have a special interest that fight really hard against any change to that. So they'll pull out any type of constitutional argument that they'll try that, that that's available and they'll fight with lobbying efforts obviously and, and, and other efforts to prevent things from happening. 
So, oh, but in South Carolina, South Carolina also has another separate bill this year to fund students as opposed to systems. I'll put it into the, um, I'll put it into the chat, but it is Senate bill. So, uh, you know, I'm curious as we 3976 looked at the, you know, the beginning of all of this and the pandemic and the schools are shutting down and parents are losing uh, jobs and employment opportunities, right? And now they're having, or they're working from home, right? They're trying to resolve these employment situations while now being fully in charge of their school's, um, uh, their child's education, right? And so what did the school systems, both you know, K through 12 and higher ed do right to sort of help with, uh, help this in this transition? And what did we really get wrong in that, you know, with, uh, in terms of burdens that we put on parents? And maybe this is partly what helped to shed some of the spotlights, but you know, maybe some examples where we, we got it right and maybe we saw some bottom up transitions and maybe some places where we really went awry speak to higher ed and this is probably something that uh, anyone that's in uh, college right now has experienced is uh, one of the things they got it right is that there was a really rapid transition to online people turned tended to be pretty adaptable to that both on the faculty side and on the student side uh, it wasn't always a seamless transition but uh, they made it work and uh, very quickly got up to speed with using some of these new technologies that uh, had for decades been uh, either haphazardly implemented or even resisted in some areas of the, the university system. Uh, what does this mean for the long run? Uh, I think that there's uh, some positive developments here and that uh, people realize that uh, different types of classes on campus have different value to them. So if you're a, an econ major, the classes that excite you, the ones that uh, you get the most out of the in-person uh, uh, traditional instruction tend to be the classes that are in your major, the ones that have the small discussion groups uh, where you have one-on-one -on -one time with the professors and you work through texts and a very deep understanding of them. Uh, on the other side of the spectrum are what we call the gen ed classes, the uh, math 101, English 101, history 101 courses that everyone takes. And I think we, we've realized that those can be delivered with about the same effectiveness online as they used to be in, in person. So there's probably some innovation that's going to be coming out of that. And it may mean in the long term that higher ed depends on uh, online instruction for the, uh, the, the large gen ed classes uh, more than it used to uh, historically. Now, the flip side of what they've gotten wrong, other than what I've already discussed, uh, one thing I've pointed out uh, fairly recently, I did a uh, kind of a mini study on this uh, using some statistics of uh, where students go to school and where, uh, where the out-of-state students happen to be. Um, higher ed, the way that it shut down back in, in March one year ago, uh, probably had some very unintended effects on, uh, on COVID transmission itself in the household. Uh, if we remember how that all took place, it was about the first two weeks of March uh, when all campuses across the country started shutting down, and they did so very rapidly. It was kind of a follow the leader effect. So when Harvard, Princeton, and Yale decided they were going to suspend operations, uh, that also meant Southwest Central Arkansas State suspends operations as well. Uh, they kind of copy who are the leaders in the field. Uh, but what it did is um, in March 2020, the pandemic had not spread nationwide yet. It was uh, still isolated in uh, some hotspot pockets that tended to be mostly in the Northeast. Uh, so like New York, Massachusetts, Connecticut, uh, those were the early outbreak states that had a real true pandemic in the first wave. Uh, yet if you were in South Dakota, there wasn't much in the way of COVID there. Yet what happened uh, in the Northeast is they shut down all the schools and I estimated uh, using some statistics on out-of-state uh, uh, registrants at these universities that almost 900,000 students that were currently living in the Northeast and attending schools in the Northeast were dispersed across the country into multi-generational households. They went home to go live with their parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles um, at the peak of the pandemic. And we just know from the way that the, um, uh, the disease spreads that 
uh, at least a few of them were probably carrying uh, positive COVID cases with them. So in an odd way, higher ed's uh, missteps in the early days of the pandemic, I would argue, probably created a super spreader event that uh, has thus far gone undiagnosed because we've been focused on other areas of the pandemic. Uh, now, is that something that could have been foreseen? Uh, probably not with the way that we, uh, we acted very hastily in, in, uh, in shutting down higher ed, but it's something I think we need to, uh, to, to reconcile and take into account for the future that maybe these hasty closures uh, need to be better thought out. Uh, maybe we should not repeat some of the same strategies that we did uh, in COVID if we have similar events in the future. Yeah, I'd, I'd say at the K-12 level, it's mostly been a bad story as far as uh, how the public school system has responded to all of this in, in a lot of places. Um, and there's been a lot of real harmful effects for students that are going to last, that could last for decades to come. I mean, the learning loss has been huge this year. You have a nationwide study, a couple of them actually, by McKinsey and Company um, over the last last year, estimating that students are losing about three months on average in learning in math and reading outcomes. And the uh, effects have been even worse for disadvantaged populations uh, as far as income is concerned. And then also uh, students of color have been losing more ground academically because of the school closures. We've also seen non-academic outcomes that have been harmed. We've seen increases in childhood obesity as reported by the Wall Street Journal with several quotes from different pediatricians. We've seen um, mental health issues skyrocketing this year. In one uh, case in particular from Clark County Public Schools, the fifth largest school district in the nation in Nevada, uh, the, teen, the student suicide rate doubled uh, since last year. Um, about 18 students committed suicide in, in, the, in the first nine months that they were looking at in, in, the, current, in the latest school year, which doubled from, from the previous year. Uh, so there's a lot of these issues that, you know, a lot of people didn't think about when they uh, were, were supporting these school closure decisions. They weren't thinking about all the unintended consequences of keeping schools closed. They weren't thinking, they were only looking at one side of the equation. They were looking at what are the costs of opening the schools? And a lot of the science has suggested that the costs are very low in terms of community transmission and risk to children and uh, risk through COVID hospitalizations in the area but they weren't looking at the other side of the equation. What are the costs of closing the schools? And we're seeing now, uh, months and months later, now about a year later since this all started, that there are tons of unforeseen consequences of, liberty, of limiting individual liberty by not allowing families to have the choice of in-person instruction. A lot of places that have opened for in-person instruction still give the families a choice for remote learning as well. And so taking that freedom away from the families has had all sorts of unintended consequences. So it's mostly been a bad picture, but there are some states that have done better than others. And most people are looking at places like Florida. Florida is essentially nearly 100% open for all students as far as having the choice for in-person versus remote learning. Not all students are in remote in, in, in person learning right now, but they do all have the choice for in-person instruction. And now just look at the contrast between Florida and California. It really tells a vivid picture. Florida only spends about $10,000, $10,700 per student, which is about 30% less than the national average. And they have much weaker teachers unions than the nation on average. Whereas California, and they have most of their schools open and every family has the choice for in-person instruction. But then on the other side of the equation, you have California, a place that spends about 38% more per student per year and has much stronger teachers unions, yet they've opted to keep most of their schools closed. And from the latest data from uh, American Enterprise Institute reported on this uh, since, uh, very recently has found that only about 3% of students have the option for full-time in-person instruction in California. So it's complete opposites, yet they, California spends a lot more and they also have stronger teachers unions. Um, so it doesn't seem like it's about money, It doesn't, but it does seem to be like it's about politics and power dynamics when you look at these two places. But look, Ford has been able to do it. Doesn't mean that they didn't have any roadblocks. Uh, you had the teachers unions right when uh, the governor said that schools should reopen. The teachers unions filed 
a, a claim in court to try to prevent the schools from reopening in person and trying to prevent families from having that option. They were not successful in court and now families have the, the opportunity to uh, make those decisions for their, for their own children. Um, so yeah, that, that's been a positive. Places like Florida, the private sector has been a positive. The uh, school choice movement <laughs> has been a positive because look, families are seeing this messed up um, power imbalance that we have in K-12 education where they don't wanna be put in this position ever again so families are looking at this and saying, well, even if I do like my public school, I should still have the option if for whatever reason that doesn't work in one particular year. I don't want, I don't want the school district and the teachers union to be playing tug of war while I'm on the sidelines saying, I can't do this. Uh, uh, I'm not getting any options for my children. I'm not, I'm having to pay out of pocket for a private school, or, or maybe you're not even able to pay out of pocket for a private school that's in person because uh, you're just not financially in the situation to do that. So the school choice movement has seen a lot of positives out, out of this in, in the past year. But, you know, man, there's just so many examples of, of negatives. It's, it's hard to remain optimistic. I mean, for, for, for how the public school system has dealt with this. Another example that I thought was egregious was right in March 2020, when the government, government was shutting down public schools, Families started to say, well, these virtual charter schools, which are privately operated, but they're defined as public schools, these seem like a good option. They're free. Um, and they've been doing this remote learning thing for decades. Maybe it's a good idea to switch to those schools. And in places such as Oregon, you had the Oregon Education Association lobbying to the government to make it illegal for families to switch to virtual charter schools in time of need. And they successfully lobbied to make it illegal. So thousands of families got blocked from switching to a school that was providing adequate remote learning at the worst time possible. You had other states in California and Pennsylvania in particular, the Pennsylvania uh, Association of School Administrators also explicitly lobbied to the government to make it illegal to switch to virtual charter schools. And they admitted, admitted it was because they were trying to protect their finances. They didn't want those families who, who saw uh, excellent alternatives for remote learning to be able to take their money elsewhere. They wanted to keep it in the district system. They didn't get everything they wanted, but they got the next best thing in Pennsylvania. They made it illegal. They made it legal to switch in theory, but none of the money would follow the child to the virtual public charter school in the state, which protected the monopoly at the expense of thousands of families. California did something similar. But this goes to show you uh, where the, pri the priorities lie for some uh, special interest groups when it comes to K-12 education. Uh, for, for in a time of need, when everything was going to hell, essentially, in March of 2020, when families were scrambling for alternatives, the union sought to protect itself and to protect the system at the expense of thousands of families in so many states. And they continued this every step of the way over the next over the past year. You still have some teachers unions uh, even now pushing against reopening schools for in-person instruction. Really and all of, this, all of this really just um, fuels the fire of families to push to be able to take their money elsewhere. Well, this, this fits with the, you know, one of the main tenets of, of public choice, right? That we get very uh, concentrated uh, benefits and very dispersed cost in these contexts. So we're, we're we've got about 15 minutes left. I'm going to give you, uh, I'm going to throw out something here to give you both to wrap up really quickly. And then I want to turn to our Q&A because I know we have some questions in there. Um, and that is we have seen some, you know, innovations. We've seen people form pods. They've had the opportunities to move to private schools, right? Um, you know, what do you think the future of education will look like um, as a result of this environment? And, you know, and what maybe improvements might we see as a result of consequences of the last year? I'll take that for higher ed. Uh, so a couple chances for change or chances for improvement. Uh, one thing we just start by noting that higher ed before COVID started was a very bloated enterprise, but bloated in a, uh, in a single direction. So if you think about the college system, there's basically three stakeholders. 
the students are the obvious one. They're getting a return on their education, or at least are supposed to be. Uh, the faculty who are providing instruction, but the one that's really uh, uh, been driving the direction of higher ed for at least several decades is the administration. You know, as I mentioned, administrators now outnumber university faculty. Uh, there are more people working in the bureaucracy than there are teaching on campus. And COVID in a weird way has kind of brought that to the forefront, just like uh, lower ed with, uh, with teachers unions brought that to the forefront, that administrative decisions are being made in the service of administrators, often to the, 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 uh, the neglect of students, certainly, and even to the neglect of faculty in some cases. Uh, so to the extent that that's being highlighted, it may be an opportunity to reorient uh, a bit of the way that we think about higher ed. Uh, now, it's a large bloated operation. Uh, we also know from public choice theory that uh, bloated provisioners of rents are very uh, uh, averse to relinquishing what they have acquired over the year, what they've invested in, even many times uh, for, for long periods of time after those rents have, uh, have uh, ceased to even deliver any function, they seem to persist. There's all sorts of uh, reasons for that, and I think we're going to see that in higher ed at the same time. Yet, if there is a, um, a silver lining in all of this, students are now realizing that they can vote with their feet. They're realizing that, that they can uh, exercise more discretion in how their, uh, uh, their education experience is received. And that's everything from transferring in credits uh, that are obtained to, through other and cheaper ways. It's everything from uh, selecting to move or transfer to schools that are doing things better than, uh, than some of the more locked down or punitive uh, universities. Uh, so just simply engaging in that experience kind of open up, opens up the door uh, to, to, you know, asking the question, uh, after COVID is over, after we've resumed normal operations, why can't we re uh, retain some of these same types of bottom-up features that have uh, developed in, uh, out of necessity during the pandemic and just apply them in, the, in normal times and get some of the benefits that, we get, uh, that we're seeing from those right now? Yeah, I'd just like to close by saying, look, um, there's tons of evidence uh, scientifically and also things that just didn't add up over the past year to suggest that this whole school reopening debate at the K-12 level has had a lot more to do with politics and power dynamics than safety and the needs of individual families. One other thing that I'll leave you with is that the Senate uh, actually did not, failed to adopt an amendment in their latest stimulus package of $128 billion towards uh, K-12 uh, uh, education, in addition to the $67 billion that's mostly unspent that it was already allocated in the past year to K-12 education. And the, the latest $128 billion, in real terms, it's about the size of the U.S. the Marshall Plan, the amount that the U.S. dedicated to rebuild Europe after World War II, it's a ton of money, and they failed to an adopt to adopt an amendment that would have made the stimulus funding contingent upon actually opening the schools for in-person instruction, given all of the teachers were vaccinated. If all the teachers are vaccinated and the money is about uh, reopening the schools, well, then why would it be a problem to pass an amendment to make the funding contingent upon reopening the schools? It just doesn't make any sense. And I can go on and on, and I've done it throughout the whole conversation with examples of things that just didn't pass the sniff test for so many families this year. And I think this is why um, I'm super optimistic going forward in the long run, because people have shifted how they think about this whole power imbalance when it comes to K-12 education. And in a way, the teachers unions for the past year have been providing free advertising for the concept of school choice for about a year now. And families are waking up and they're seeing that there's not any good reason to fund institutions, particularly closed institutions, when you can fund students directly instead. So our first question um, is posed this way. Do you think that once we reopen, that things will go back to normal and people will forget all the bad decisions that were made? Will we lose this ground, if you will, I'm paraphrasing here, but will we lose the ground we may have made on reform? I'll say it's, it's possible. It's possible that people who are, another thing that we didn't talk about is how many people already left the public school system that pulled their kids out and said, oh, no, this is, this is not working. 
Uh, more advantaged families have already pulled their kids out and started things called pandemic pods, where they're getting five to 10 children together in a household to essentially economize and outsource the process of homeschooling to make it more economically feasible. You have families enrolling their kids in private schools because the public schools aren't open, which again, it, it leads to inequities. And the best way to fix that is to fund the student directly so that more families can have access to these types of alternatives. But some, some families will go back, but some might not. And we don't know how many that's going to be, but the estimates, estimates statewide from different departments of education have been about a three to 5% reduction in the proportion of students in traditional public schools in various states. So we, we're seeing that happening, that, that foot voting already happening, even without the expansion of school choice programs. So I think long-term there's going to be um, a lot more homeschoolers, a lot more people in the private school sector, a lot more people choosing charter schools. Um, I just, I can't tell you how much that's going to be. And I think people aren't going to forget, this is people's children that have been affected at the K-12 level, at least, that have been harmed in serious ways, academically, mentally, and physically in the past year. People don't just forget that. Um, this is such a big mess up from the public school monopoly this year that, you know, a lot of people aren't going to forget it. And they're going to continue pushing for policies like education savings accounts or what I call funding students directly. So I'm optimistic for uh, educational freedom going forward. Go On the higher ed side question. of things, I think there's an interesting uh, opportunity here to, uh, to, to assess what went wrong, but I also think there's going to be some lingering memory. So just as people are, are realizing that teachers unions have kind of shown their true face, they've also seen that university administrations in many cases have shown their true face. And that's everything from we have instances of schools that uh, kick students off of campus without any refund for the semester because they were caught partying in like a friend's dorm room, uh, which may be a, like a minor infraction, but it's been a, a very punitive approach to pandemic policies. That stuff is not going to be forgotten uh, very quickly. Uh, the other dimension I didn't get into too much, but uh, higher ed's uh, faculty, um, I'd, say, I'd argue for, uh, for, for the worse, has become extremely politicized really in, in recent decades. And I think that's accelerated during the pandemic. Uh, but what it means in, in the public's eye, there's a, uh, a continued decline in trust that uh, the average voter, that the average American places in university systems. And a lot of this is a, uh, a backlash to uh, the way that faculty have politicized research, politicized the classroom uh, and moved uh, most of their normal functions in a direction that uh, really kind of jumps into the culture war stuff that we're seeing all over society. And, and this has um, also been true of research that's come out on pandemics. Uh, so I just posed the question, uh, would you trust an epidemiologist today more or less than you would have trusted that same person exactly a year ago? And I think the, uh, the, the last year's experience in most people's minds, they've seen enough flip-flopping, contradiction, bad models, bad predictions, uh, two weeks to flatten the curve turns into a year to flatten the curve. Uh, that's eroding trust in one of the main functions that universities did. And I think that's going to shape uh, the public's willingness to give money uh, to universities for years to come, including tax dollars. So, um... Just Mears is asking the question, how can the partisan divide on the issue of school choice um, be less of a, a barrier right, uh, for legislation implementation? How can we maybe get around that? What's interesting is the majority of constituents, whether you're a Democrat, Republican, or independent, support the concept of funding students directly. And if you look at the logic of the arguments, it makes sense too, because a lot of the people who support funding students directly when it comes for, to higher education with Pell Grants and the GI Bill and with pre-K with things like Head Start and other pre-K, state funded pre-K programs, they get all up in arms only when it comes to the K-12 years. And again, the only difference is one of power dynamics. It's not one of logic or desires on the parts of the constituents. The only difference is the power imbalance, when it, uh, the power dynamic when it comes to having a special interest that profits from getting your children's education dollars, regardless of how well they do. So the problem is at the state level, uh, what we're seeing for the most part is that the Democrats, even though the majority of their constituents tend to support the policy, are voting no against the policy in the state houses. So it doesn't mean it's always the case. We, we saw a Democrat last night in Kentucky vote for their 
um, proposal to fund students instead of systems. So it, they, they do cross party lines sometimes, but you know, uh, if you look at the, if you just go, to, go on the website for Open Secrets, for example, and look at the American Federation for Teachers, the second largest teachers union in the U.S., and look at the percentage of donations that go to Democrats versus Republicans from the from that body of 1.7 million members, 99% uh, or more goes to the Democratic Party candidates. So that's very powerful when it comes to how the votes turn out. Uh, when it comes when it when it comes to the school choice bills but the logic of the arguments are bipartisan so i say we continue hitting the logic of the arguments and exposing the logical inconsistencies when it comes to supporting one thing that funds people directly but not supporting it only when it comes to k-12 i mean you can continue with the analogy with food stamps for example we don't tell low-income families they must spend their food stamps at a residentially assigned government-run grocery store. No, instead the money rightfully goes to the family and you could choose Walmart, Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, any provider of the service that works best for you. And choosing Trader Joe's doesn't steal money from Walmart because the money belongs to the family and everybody understands that. With K-12 education, we should just apply the same logic and fund people, not buildings, particularly when those buildings are closed. And so I say we continue hitting this because hopefully at least truth will prevail in the end. So um, with regards to reopening, and you know, we've talked about the fact that there's been a lot of barriers to this. Uh, West Camp is asking, you know, um, are schools reopening asking students, parents to sign agreements, sort of releasing the schools from liabilities uh, with regards to COVID and you know, our parents willing to do that? Is that maybe, you know, something that's been offered and maybe it doesn't, uh, and yet barriers are still thrown up. So what's been happening in that regard? So I don't, I don't have comprehensive data on that for K through 12, but I have heard that is that being um, a, a, a proposed solution to incentivize the schools to be more likely to reopen. Um, because yeah, if there's all this liability uh, that could come along with an outbreak, then the school may decide to keep its doors shut. So one way to divvy up those costs is to allow each individual family to um, sign those kind, kinds of waivers. Um, I, I just don't know how widespread this is, but I have heard of these types of things happening. And in higher ed, it's, it's really taking place on a state-to-state -state basis. Uh, depends on what the state laws permit. Uh, some states actually have pretty good laws, not only for um, educational institutions, but for businesses across the board that um, exempt the proprietor of the business from liability for, say, if COVID were caught on site. Uh, I think the, the flip side to that is one of the major motives that caused higher ed to panic and, and very rapidly shut down, even in advance of everyone else, even though they uh, presented themselves as acting responsibly, what was really going on there was an attempt to limit liability to uh, avoid, say, a lawsuit if, if COVID broke out during, in a dorm and, uh, and my kid caught it because of the dorm. Uh, the idea was that I was going to be able to sue uh, the university and schools wanted to avoid that. So they really cloaked um, uh, risk aversion on the part of administrators under uh, the, the, this kind of high-minded uh, moralizing when we're doing the responsible thing for uh, society. Like, even the president of, uh, I think it was Harvard, Yale, and uh, Stanford wrote a, an op-ed in the New York Times saying, well, we did the responsible thing and shut down. Uh, rest of society needs to follow our model. And what they're really saying is, we did. Uh, we took all the steps to limit our, our personal liability as institutions, and we're going to pretend that we were doing something that's uh, uh, worthy of commendation and valor. This also reminds me, in, in some places, you had the public schools closing, and of course they were celebrating that decision because they get the same funding through the property tax system. I mean, it's not that they're bad people, it's just the incentives. But then you had you know, some news stories about private school enrollments going up, and I'm thinking in Maryland in particular. And then you had uh, orders to close the private schools fo follow shortly thereafter. Um, and some people uh, were theorizing, I think Walter Olson at Cato wrote something on this for the Maryland case in particular, theorizing that it's actually pretty convenient for the private schools to close uh, just until after the count day for when public schools can count the students and get the funding for the full year. Um, it's awfully, it was awfully convenient for the private schools to be forced to close by the 
by the county health officials um, just until after that day. And we, we didn't have evidence of explicit lobbying for that to happen, but uh, it's not a crazy thing to kind of think about where there could have been a case where public schools lobbied to, to shut down their competition, particularly in places where the private school enrollments were going up and, and, and uh, Maryland County Public, in the Montgomery County Public Schools in Maryland, they, they were seeing pretty huge drops in enrollment at that time too. All right, so um, this is gonna be our last question. Um, so Lord W asks, hundreds of pandemic pods are functioning better for families with young children than, and then schools was. In my city, there was, um, they were being told such arrangements are illegal um, and they're not to be tolerated much longer. So are there protections or dispersions for people running tiny nonprofit programs that don't comply with the regulations for quote enrolling school um, and you know and don't intend to? Are there are there going to be ways that we could you know work around these so that these could in fact persist? That's my own little part in there. Hmm. Um, I'll just add that I have a um, I have a good friend of mine and you know they've done this with their children. And it's been quite successful. They um, and they've you know employed. Uh, an educator that wouldn't actually have otherwise, you know, been able to um, have an opportunity, right? So their kids have been better off. They've made this person better off. And yet maybe there's, you know, the yeah, idea the, that somebody's preventing this seems, seems very sad. The regulations differ by state, but I know of like two places where they had some weird regulations popping up in Colorado and Massachusetts. It was, if you had more than four uh, non-related students in the same building, you had to be registered as a daycare or something. And so that was kind of this barrier to entry. Um, but for the most part, I didn't see a ton of this happening, but I would say for people to look to hslda.org, it's a homeschool advocacy organization. They have a state-by-state -state rule for um, uh, the rules for different uh, homeschooling laws in each state. So you can go to your state and check it out and see what might apply and you could also reach out to their legal uh, scholars to, to see if there's any issues with, with uh, governments trying to regulate pandemic pods. So that's uh, something I would look to. But I mean, a lot of this is, has to do again with the monopoly really freaking out, like right, right when all of this started and we saw a lot of families switching to pandemic pods or micro schools, you had different superintendents, for example, Denver Public School Superintendent sent out a big email and the first thing that they complained about was we're going to lose, you know, half of the funding for that student if they leave to a uh, pandemic pod. Oh, that's going to be horrible for the rest of us, which actually is pretty great because if you only lose half of the funding for a student you're no longer educating, you end up with more funding per student left behind. Just imagine if Walmart got to keep 50% of your grocery bill in perpetuity, even after you left and started shopping at Trader Joe's. That would be great for Walmart. Similarly great for the public schools that get to keep a ton of your money. But then they, yeah, they started to try to say it was like segregation for families to choose um, alternatives with pan pandemic pods. And uh, they could have fixed that by opening their schools. And they also could have fixed that by funding the students directly to allow more families to access these alternatives. But it was a lot of freaking out on the, t on the part of the superintendents in the public school system. But yeah, I would, to the point of the question, I would reach out to HSLDA. They're really helpful with pushing it back at, at any types of, any of these types of onerous reg regulations. We've reached the end of our time. I really want to thank uh, Phil and Corey for being with us this afternoon um, and enlightening on this topic. And, and hopefully the silver linings out of this will continue, right? And that we can see the positive movements uh, in school reform. Um, Adam Smith was, was a major proponent of wanting to see, right, the least fortunate of us uh, advance in society and our education system has done, um, at least the public school system, I think, has done very little to do that um, and continues maybe to do this. So hopefully this is shedding light on some of those inequities and, and some of the ways in which people can improve uh, the system. Um, so I want to thank I want to thank you both for being here. I want to thank AIR again for sponsoring this, the Boss Chat Society chapters. Uh, for those of you who are interested, again, there are still several events left in Adam Smith Week tonight at six o'clock. We have Virginia Postrel. I know in the chat we put the link to um, 
to the schedule and to the events. And then next, and then on Thursday, we have um, three events and Friday still one more. So there's lots of good things still coming ahead. I would encourage you and hope that many of you will um, uh, be able to participate. I know that we didn't get to everyone's questions and I'm sorry about that, but um, perhaps uh, Corey and Phil be willing to throw their contact information into the uh, chat if any of you want to um, continue this conversation uh, beyond this. And I encourage you to look for the work of Phil and uh, Phil Magnus at AIER and, and Corey at um, Reason and, and Cato, right, to uh, continue to follow their progress on this. Gentlemen, thank you both for being with us today. Thank you so much for having us. Thanks.